Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the official launch of the Volunteer Leaders Toolkit. So this toolkit is a resource for volunteer leaders in emergency services. It was developed by researchers at Curtin University, two of whom I will introduce to you shortly. Now it's supported by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre, which has now ended, and its successor organisation, Natural Hazards Research Australia. My name is Blythe McLennan. I'm a research manager at Natural Hazards Research Australia and formerly a researcher of emergency volunteering. And so I am especially pleased to be your host today and to see this toolkit launch. Um, and with such high interest as well, we had almost 300 registrations for the webinar today. So clearly a lot of interest in this tool. I want to begin the webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which we're all respectively joining the event today from across Australia. Um, for my part, I live and work on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I recognise their lands as having always been places of teaching, of learning and of research. We have three speakers today. Uh, the first speaker is Associate Professor Patrick Dunlop from Curtin University's Future of Work Institute. Patrick is an academic whose research focuses on the attraction, recruitment, assessment and selection of new personnel, and that includes volunteers. And he's particularly focused on how these processes occur in the context of rapid technological change. He's undertaken extensive research with volunteer involving organisations, um, including major projects with, in collaboration with emergency services and with scouts. And these projects have culminated in some of the resources that we'll be sharing with you today. So Pat is going to give us an overview of the toolkit. Our second speaker is Hawa Muhammad Farid, also from Curtin University's Future of Work Institute. Uh, Hawa has a master's in industrial and organizational psychology. She's a registered psychologist and she's worked for the last three years in volunteering research, undertaking several projects with emergency services. And our third and final speaker is Kate, Catherine White, who's a senior coordinator for volunteer capability and sustainability at the Department of Fire and Emergency Services, or DFES, in Western Australia. So Kate has broad operational and strategic experience in volunteer management. In her current role at DFES, she's focused on the renewal of the DFES volunteer sustainability strategy, aiming to address challenges experienced by emergency service volunteer teams. Um, so Hawa is going to be demonstrating one of the resources in the toolkit in a bit more depth and Kate is going to talk to us a little bit about the ways that the resources are already being used within DFES. So without any further ado, I'd just like to welcome our first speaker, Associate Professor Patrick Dunlop, to kick us off today with an overview of the toolkit. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Blythe. Hello, everybody. Uh, the first challenge is, can I share my screen? Let's do that. Hope, hoping you can all see my slides. Yep, excellent, thanks. If you see me looking over there, that's just because that's where the video feed is. I'll try not to do it too much. So look, we are so excited today to be sharing these resources with you. Um, they've been the culmination of, oh, I think we're up to seven years worth of research in partnership with, with various emergency services bodies. Um, and I'm really pleased that Kate White could join us to give us some insights from the, pra the practitioner side of things, because you don't just want to hear from a pair of academics about practical matters. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation, Blythe and team, and, and thanks for tuning in. It's great to see so many people sign up. Um, so what we want to share with you today is our new resource, which we've called Supporting Your Volunteers, and we framed it as a volunteer leader toolkit. Um, now I'm going to give you a quick high level overview of what we mean by that. What we've done is we've put together three separate modules uh, which speak to three issues that uh, many volunteer leaders have raised with us throughout our research. And those were around attracting new volunteers. So we've got a module focused on helping uh, volunteer leaders recruit new volunteers to the emergency services. Um, and what do you do when you get new leaders in, uh, new volunteers in? You have to onboard them. You have to socialise them, make them feel welcome into your group. And so we've got a module dedicated to that. And then we've got a third module, which is about leading and, and um, engaging your volunteers in the emergency services. So we'll go into a bit of detail um, in, in a few moments, but I just wanted to start with a nice high level overview. Um, the, the resource is for, it's for a lot of people. We were uh, sort of imagining that today's volunteer leaders would find this useful. 
um, volunteer leaders the, of the future, the people who are thinking about, so if you're a volunteer and you're thinking about moving into a leadership role, you might like to have a look through these resources. They might give you some ideas. Um, curious volunteers who just want to learn about this stuff might find this interesting. Volunteer associations may, if so, if you're a member of an association or you're involved with the association, you might, um, it might be good to know about these resources in case your volunteers ask you for support in these areas. Um, uh, volunteer group coordinators such as district officers would probably find these useful resources to distribute. If you're involved with online learning management, you might be interested to think in considering uploading these things into your learning management system. Uh, strategic volunteering personnel in the headquarters might also be interested. And indeed, volunteer managers from outside of the emergency services. And I'll tell you a quick story. The person who did the filming for the videos actually used, after reading the scripts for some of our resources, he actually put, put some of those practices into place with his own business. So even small business owners might find uh, value in these resources, although they're not designed for that necessarily. There are so many people and groups that we need to acknowledge to make this happen. We had a team ultimately over those seven years, I mentioned 12 researchers uh, from the University of Western Australia and Curtin University um, and a lot of master's placement students as well. We had enormous support from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services who, who, who funded some of the earlier versions of these resources um, and also from the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC who, who gave us a, a, a nice, a couple of really um, generous grants uh, which enabled the research to to be done and also the development of these resources. And also the, I'd like to acknowledge the Natural Hazards Research Australia for inviting us to present on their turf today, even though the CRC was the, the forebear. Also got some uh, individuals we'd like to acknowledge. We've got some individual volunteers who contributed some insights from their own groups. Um, I know some of you have signed in today, so thank you very much. You can see your names up on the board. And of course, our advisory committee. This was a group of people who kept us honest and made sure that what we were delivering was, was relevant and, and useful. Okay, so who are we and why do we think we might have something to say about this? Well, our background is in organisational psychology. And if you haven't heard of organisational psychology, you're not alone. Most people think organisational psychologists just counsel workers while they lie down on a couch. In fact, what we do is we take the principles that we've learned from 100 years of research into human, uh, the human psyche and we take that into work and volunteer settings. So what we often do is um, we often try to improve management practice at the coalface and you really could boil it down in, in, into us trying to answer the question, what makes people tick? Or in this case, what makes our volunteers tick? So when we undertook our research, we had various uh, questions that we wanted to answer. Um, and and this, this again is very high level, but it should give you a sense of what we were interested in exploring. The first question is around recruitment. So what does it take to become an emergency services volunteer? Who should be recruited and how do you attract those people? Uh, retention is obviously a big issue. There's no good recruiting loads of volunteers if they're all going to leave shortly afterwards. So we wanted to understand why do volunteers continue? What keeps them around? How can we keep more people around? Uh, we also want to understand what makes volunteers happy. We're not just aspiring to, for our volunteers to survive. We want them to thrive and grow and have, a, a, have an awesome time while they're with the, the services. So we were interested in understanding volunteer well-being and engagement. And finally, we were under, interested in learning about how to attract uh, new volunteers from, from sources that might not have been considered in the past. We had a strong diversity focus as well. So our mission was to find, if you like, answers to these four questions. But not only that, we also needed to do something with those answers. So in order to find those answers, we consulted wide, widely. We interviewed over 100 volunteers from all the services uh, in Western Australia. We spoke to many volunteer leaders. We also engaged the volunteer associations and district officers, um, most especially in Western Australia. And of course, I mentioned our panel of um, end users, our stakeholders. Um, so the key point is this isn't just us pushing down academic stuff. This is, this is um, you know, we're mostly feeding back what we learn from, from interviewing these people and, and engaging with these people. We also undertook two surveys as part of the Bushfire Natural Hazards uh, Research Centre um, project. So the, the, the key takeaway for us is, oh, sorry, what we tried to take away from this exercise was a strong understanding of what volunteers actually need, what they want, what they would like a resource to look like. And we're hoping that we've delivered on that. So we answered those questions in our research. And the second part of our mission was to translate these answers into something that volunteer leaders can actually use. So we've, we've, um, we, our goal was to create a set of resources that would be user friendly, highly relevant to emergency services volunteering, and of course, very practical. 
Um, and so we've developed a set uh, and, and we've got, we've ca I've categorized them here into seven different types of resources. But what you'll see from Hawa is, is uh, more information about the content and how those resources are structured. So again, this is uh, simply us feeding, uh, delivering on what people asked us to deliver. So one set of resources is the, uh, the what, what we've got a set of short videos. I think there are 37 videos all up. We've just set up a YouTube channel, but you can also download the raw video footage. So you can see importantly that the videos are all very brief. So ranging from roughly a minute to, to four minutes. I think that might be the longest one there, that four minute video. The point is you should be able to just watch one video and then duck out and watch another one at another time. Uh, we've got reflection exercises, which are designed to get volunteer leaders thinking about uh, you know, how they got to where they are. Um, we know that reflection is a really helpful um, a really helpful activity for learning. So I'll show you a couple of examples there. In the introduction to the recruitment module, we asked the volunteer leaders to think about um, how they first, how, how did they get recruited? How did they first find out? What processes did they go through? And was it, was it an enjoyable or challenging process? And similarly, uh, we've got a, a reflection exercise for the onboarding module, which you can see on the right, the right hand slide. We've also developed a set of step-by-step -step guides uh, with, with, which are designed to be easy to remember and easy to implement. So on this slide, you can see the example from the onboarding process. So we've broken onboarding down into five uh, discrete steps, registering, inducting, supporting, training, and engaging. And we've developed a checklist, which is designed to, to support uh, the volunteer, make sure you know the, that, you, that you remember to do all of the things involved in each step. So we've got lots of checklists like these. Uh, tip sheets, we've, we've got lots of feedback that having uh, sort of single sided sheets of paper with, with some advice on there can be incredibly helpful. So I'll just show you a couple of examples. So this is uh, what to do and what not to do. So this is uh, what to do um, when, when, you're, when you've got a volunteer who is uh, going through uh, their probationary period. So you communicate effectively, what does that look like? Ineffective communication, what is, does that look like and how do we avoid that? Um, another example is giving feedback to volunteers. We know this is a major challenge for volunteer leaders, especially if they've just taken on the leader role and they haven't had much experience giving feedback to people. And so this, this tip sheet here just gives some examples of, of how to give very concrete uh, positive feedback and how to give concrete negative feedback. Um, I won't whiz through all of these things, but I just wanted to make the point that there are tip sheets for many other topics, including interviewing uh, volunteers, uh, sharing responsibilities, so how to, how to work out who to delegate, delegate tasks to, and uh, how to solicit feedback from your volunteers and make use of that. We've also got a set of guidelines, uh, so some practical guidelines. So here's an example of, of um, ways that you, ideas for how you might uh, like to recognise your volunteers. So you've got, it breaks it down into two categories, informal and verbal recognition versus more tangible recognition, such as award nights. Now I should say, I just wanna reiterate that the stuff you're reading in there is a combination of what we've learned from, from our background in psychology. But really most of these examples are examples we observed in the different groups that we'd, that we'd, um, that we'd visited throughout our, our project. So a lot of this stuff is already being done, just not necessarily all at once by all the groups. Uh, we've also, we also got um, asked if we could build editable templates, so document um, structures that enable you to do things quite quickly. So a good example of that is this one, which is a, a volunteer role description uh, statement. These statements are really helpful for recruiting volunteers and also managing expectations of people in those roles. So the idea would be a volunteer leader could, could uh, take this template, fill it in for one role, print it out or save it, and then duplicate it and fill it in again for another role. And there are other um, editable templates like this in the package. And finally, we wanted to put some case studies in there. We wanted to demonstrate in these resources that this stuff is possible. Not only, not only is it helpful, it can actually be implemented. And so we've got case studies in two formats. We've got some uh, written examples uh, where, where volunteer groups have, have managed to implement something. Um, but thanks to uh, the contributions from, from um, many volunteers from Western Australia, we've also got some video examples of, of volunteer groups across the, the state who had implemented uh, some of the practices um, in there. And how will we talk a little bit more about those in the next section? Um, so that's almost the end of my spiel. I guess I just wanted to finish with, with one um, note, which was really around the guiding philosophy. This is something um, we took away from our interactions with DFES, but also with the volunteers themselves is they're looking for support. They're not looking to be bossed around. So we would encourage anybody who decides to use these resources is to treat them as resources that are there to help, there to inform, but not as something that everybody has to do to get their certificate uh, before they're allowed to be a volunteer. We see this as being a, a source of support, not a source of, of, of directives or compulsory form filling. 
So I, I'll now pass over to Hawa, um, who will walk you through the, the content of these resources. Thank you. Okay, so now the challenge is going to be if I can share my screen successfully. Let's see how this goes. Um, can any can everybody see my screen? Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm just going to. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Pat, for giving uh, an overview of, of the projects and, and everything that we've done so far to, to get to where we are today. So for my portion of uh, the webinar, I'm actually going to be taking you through uh, the modules and give you an in-depth, I guess, um, overview of all of the topics that we cover in each of the modules. So in total, we have three modules. So module one is all about recruiting volunteers for the emergency services. Module two is supporting new volunteers in the emergency services. So this is all about how you can onboard new volunteers who have, who have just joined the emergency services and basically guide them through their first year. And then module three is how you can lead volunteers effectively in the emergency services. So uh, within each uh, module, you actually have, I guess, a dedicated instructor, if you want to call it that. So uh, each of us will kind of dedicate it to a module. So Pat, uh, who you know you just uh, heard from is uh, responsible for module one which is all about recruiting that's his area of expertise it's his uh, bread and butter so uh yeah so he's pretty much the person that you're going to see in all of the instructional videos that you see in module one so in module two which is all about onboarding and supporting new volunteers uh, the person that you're going to be seeing in those videos is going to be me and then in the third module, which is all about leading volunteers effectively, you've got uh, two presenters in that one. And that is uh, Professor Marilyn Gagne, who uh, works with us here at the uh, Future Work Institute, as well as Dr. Daria Krak, who works at University of Western Australia. So now we're gonna get into uh, the resources that we created, and I'm gonna give you a bit of a breakdown. So across the three, modules that we created, we created 37 training videos in total. And the 37 training videos are across all of the three modules. We also interviewed one volunteering group per module. So we've got uh, one volunteering group for the recruiting module, one for the onboarding module, and one for the leading module. And across all of the three modules, we actually created 17 videos. And the 17 videos are taken, I guess, as case studies where you know, we asked questions from the, um, so we asked questions to the volunteering group to ask them on how they recruit and onboard and lead their volunteers. And they shared their stories with us. So you can uh, maybe take that as like an example of what you can practice within your own volunteering groups and organizations. Uh, and lastly, we also have a 45 individual resources that we created. And when I say individual resources, this refers to things such as, you know, editable templates, uh, tip sheets, guidelines, uh, yeah, basically things that you can take into your own group and actually use that as part of your learning process. So I'm now going to be going into each of the modules and giving you an overview of all of the content that we actually have. Uh, so the first one is all about recruiting volunteers for the emergency services. So I've actually got five uh, overarching topics within the recruitment module. So the first one is introduction. So uh, this is where Pat actually introduces you into the recruitment module and gives you an overview of the topics and the content that is available within that module. You then go into the second topic, which is all about planning. So that's where you plan your recruitment uh, process and kind of plan your recruitment strategies and how you're gonna go about, uh, I guess, curating your recruitment campaign. You then go into the third folder or uh, topic, which is all about promoting. So that's where you promote the recruitment opportunities to prospective volunteers. You then go into select, which is where you select from the prospective volunteers through things such as effective interviewing to be able to recruit the right volunteers for your group or organization. Uh, and then we round off this module with a conclusion uh, folder. So just to give you an idea of, you know, this is the kind of content that you would get in an introduction folder. So we've got an instructional video. So this is where Pat will actually take you through uh, some of the topics that we're going to cover and give you an overview of what you can expect from this module. You then have a reflection exercise where you are asked to take a moment to reflect back and think about your recruitment strategies that you have uh, applied in your volunteering group so far and think about what you can do to improve and have that moving forward. 
And then we have a volunteering video where we actually introduce you to the volunteers uh, who will take you through some of their stories about how they recruit effectively within their group. So some of the topics that we cover in the plan module. So like now I'm gonna be taking you through, I guess, an overview of what you can expect from this module. Uh, so in the plan um, topic, we have uh, five subtopics. So the topics that we cover in this one is how to make your volunteering group an appealing place to be, how you can prepare volunteer role descriptions so that prospective volunteers have a much more detailed idea of what are some of their tasks and responsibilities uh, that they're gonna have to do if they're going to be you know, signing up for that role, how to identify your recruitment target. So this is you know, referring to when you wanna think about who you want to target in terms of recruiting, whether it's you know, more women or people of different abilities, uh, how can you actually um, I guess, curate your recruitment strategies and campaigns so that you are actually targeting those specific groups that you want to recruit from. And then we have learn from the past, which is where uh, you're you know, asked to kind of reflect back on your previous recruitment strategies and you know, think about how you can improve on that and how you can use you know, your previous experiences to be able to improve on that for future recruitment strategies. Uh, and then lastly, taking everything that you learned from the past, um, how can you form a promotion strategy to actually promote volunteering opportunities um, for your group? So in the third, um, I guess, topic, we have where you cover, you know, how can you promote volunteering opportunities to prospective volunteers? And the way that you can do that is getting your recruitment messaging right and choosing your recruitment channels. So I'm actually going to be going through into the choosing your recruitment channels and what that folder actually looks like, just to give you an idea of the content that you can expect. So in this particular topic, we have two videos, as you can see at the top, where um, there's an instructional video about how you can choose recruitment channels. And what we mean by recruitment channels, it has to do with, you know, what are some ways that you can actually promote volunteering opportunities? So uh, examples of recruitment channels that you could use, for example, is traditional media, such as uh, newspaper ads or, you know, radio or television. Uh, another example of a recruitment channel is social media, which is becoming, uh, you know, more popular in the technological age that we live in now. And then to kind of supplement the instructional video, we then have a volunteering video where we actually ask, you know, volunteers, you know, how do you promote volunteering opportunities with your group to the wider community? And to supplement this, we also have a tip sheet going through all of the, I guess, recruitment channels. So for example, you can see here, it actually goes through, you know, what is traditional media, when and how can you use it? And what are some of the pros and cons of using traditional media? And then it goes through all the different ones such as, you know, social media. And, you know, I think one of the other ones is word of mouth with, which is very common, especially in uh, smaller regional towns. Um, so yeah, so just to give you an idea of the kind of content that you can um, expect. And then we then have the select uh, folder, which goes into how you can select uh, the right volunteers for your group using effective interviewing techniques and questions, but also how can you give feedback to successful applicants, but also non-successful applicants, just to let them know, you know, if they don't manage to make it through your recruitment process, how can you let them know the news and do it in a, in a gentle way so that, you know, that potentially in the future, you can actually get them to apply again if there is a role that is more suitable for them. And then to round off the recruitment module, we have a conclusion folder where Pat basically summarizes the key takeaway points. Um, and yeah, so that's basically a summary of the recruitment module. Okay, going into the second module, which is all about supporting new volunteers in the emergency services. This is my, I was gonna say this is my baby, but it kind of is. Um, this is uh, the module that I was responsible for and I took it very seriously and very much. Um, okay, so in total, we've got uh, nine topics uh, and nine folders. So the first one is introduction where I give you an overview of our onboarding process. And I give you, you know, some of the, the key takeaway messages or, you know, the key content that you can expect from us in the onboarding module. Uh, you then can see that we've got steps one through to five, where we actually go through each of the onboarding steps that we recommend that you take with new volunteers. So we've got step one, which is all about registering your new volunteers and making sure that they're filling out the required paperwork that they are required to fill out at the very start and making sure that you make them feel welcome. 
You then have step two, which is all about inducting your new volunteers. So this is at the point where you give them all of the information that they need to know upfront so that they're aware of what they should be doing uh, as a new volunteer. We then go into step three, which is all about supporting your new volunteers. So this is where you give new volunteers emotional and informational support. And some of the ways that you can do this is by giving them a support individual. So this can be in the form of a mentor or a peer buddy. If they are, you know, if there are multiple new volunteers, you can assign them to a peer buddy so that they can go through, I guess, experiences and training together. Uh, and if your group is big enough and you, and you happen to have uh, a volunteer coordinator in place, you can also assign the volunteer coordinator to be responsible for new volunteers so that they can give them emotional and informational support. You then go into step four, which is all about training your new volunteers. So this is where you give them, you know, the knowledge and the skills that they require to be able to perform effectively as a volunteer. And then the final one, which is all about engaging your new volunteers. This is kind of at the point where if the volunteer has done everything that they need to within the first, you know, three to 12 months, uh, and they've done all of their training, they've done their induction. Uh, this is the point where, you know, you give them a good old pat on the back and give them the uniform to be like, yay, you're now a fully functional volunteer. And basically, you know, how can you celebrate that with them? Um, you then go into the seventh topic, which is all about probation. So what to do and what not to do uh, during the probationary period. We then have uh, an eighth folder, which is all about additional resources. So we've got some some seriously cool onboarding templates and checklists, which I'm super proud of. I'm going to show you in a second. And then we have a conclusion folder to round off this, um, this, this module. Okay, so again, just to give you an idea of uh, the content that you would get from example step three, supporting your new volunteers, we have a video where I talk you through some of the key strategies and tips on how you can support your new volunteers. Uh, if you want to have support individuals such as mentors or peer buddies in place, how can you do that? What are some of the things that they should, you know, uh, give them support on and how can you actually set that up within your volunteering group? We then have a case study where we spoke to volunteers from uh, the Marine Rescue, as you can see on the screen, they were super lovely people and they let me get onto their boat, which I was super excited about. Um, so I actually got to ask them, you know, how they provide informational and social support to, to new volunteers and they shared some ideas with us. Uh, and then we have a thinking exercise, which you can see on the left side of the screen here, uh, where you can have um, I guess to think about what support systems you currently have in place in your volunteering group and how can you improve the support system so that you can provide, I guess, more support to your new volunteers who enter your group in the future. So the folder that I'm probably the most excited about is the additional resources folder. This looks uh, really impressive. <laughs> and maybe intimidating to some, but I'll talk you through each of the each of the resources. So we actually have a video. Can people see my mouse? Actually, I just realized. Okay, cool. So I've got a video here where I actually talk you through each of the resources that you can expect from this folder. So we've got uh, two induction templates here, some instructions on how you can use the templates here, uh, a template for letter of active engagement and an onboarding checklist. So let's just go through every single one of those resources now. Um, so if I can get to the next slide, that'd be great. There we go. Okay, so we've got two uh, induction templates here. So our intention with creating these templates is that when uh, a volunteer first comes in, you want to give them all of the information that they need to know upfront. So we've provided templates that you know you can usually you can use these to actually present all the information that they, you, you want to give them up front in either a booklet form or as a PowerPoint presentation. So within the booklet and also within the PowerPoint presentation, we've actually got slides um, and guidelines with uh, the kind of information that you can include, such as you know things like code of conduct, uh, roster information, things like how they can log into the training portal, where they can get uh, social support and things like that. So just, you know, dot points with guidelines are the kind of information that you can include. And we've also got instructional like instructions on how you can fill out these templates, um, how much information you should put into it, you know, how often you should be updating these documents. And the idea that we we had when we created this these templates is that uh, every volunteering group will have, you know, different information that they would want a new volunteer to know. So we want to make sure that these uh, templates are actually customizable for each volunteering group so that, you know, they can make it their own. And, you know, I've seen some people actually use 
these templates and some people actually put things like you know they they'll put like the the structure of their volunteering group so they'll have the the captain and then they'll have the lieutenant and then they'll actually have like little information about the person so not just like you know what what's their volunteering role but things like you know what's their favorite netflix movie and things like that so uh you can really customize it and really make it your own so i guess that's the intention with why we created these templates so we've also got a template for a letter of active engagement. So what I mean by that is when a new volunteer has done everything that they need to within the first three to 12 months, and they're at that stage where they are now a fully functional volunteer, how can you celebrate that? So what we usually recommend is that you usually give them some kind of certificate or a letter to tell them, hey, you've done everything that you, you can do at this point and you're now a fully functional volunteer. So congratulations, you know, thank you so much for all of your contribution and efforts. Uh, what happens next? And so this is the point where you give them information about, you know, their rosters, their team allocations, uh, how many call outs they can expect to go on and, and things like that. Then we have an onboarding checklist which basically has all the key strategies and recommended, I guess, um, processes that you should take a new volunteer through. So we've got all of the five steps there from registering, inducting, supporting, training, and engaging your new volunteers. Um, and we've made it so that you can basically just tick things off. You can print it out if you choose to, um, or you can even like tick it off in, in the PDF, I guess, Adobe would be what you'd be using if you were to download these documents. Um, but yeah. Okay, on to the third module. So for this one, I'm actually going to be deep diving into the actual uh, module itself, just so you can actually see if you were to download these modules from the website, what would it actually look like? So before I do that, I'm just gonna give you an overview of the topics that we actually cover in this module. So we've got an introduction uh, folder, and then we've got uh, a topic on how to influence volunteers how to share knowledge and information with your volunteers, how to share responsibilities and you know, delegate tasks to volunteers, how to include and involve them. So this has to do with you know, inclusion, uh, with the decision-making processes, but also how to embrace diversity, how to provide uh, constructive and negative feedback to volunteers, but also how to receive and use feedback from volunteers. And then we've got a few more topics such as you know, how to recognize achievements and contributions made by volunteers, how to deal with conflict, how to plan uh, for you know, succession and developing the next generation of leaders, how to adjust your leadership and management style to the situation that you're in. And then finally, we have a conclusion folder to kind of round everything off. So I'm gonna be taking you through uh, Maybe we won't do all three folders. Maybe we'll do like two of them. Um, but I'll take you through the introduction folder so you can see um, what an introduction folder of one of these modules would actually look like. And then maybe we'll go into the recognizing achievements and contributions folder. So let's dive in. So this is actually a QR code with the link of how to actually get to the website. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second. So if you were to actually um, put in the link to the resource kit, this will actually take you to the website. So this is uh, the website where it's actually hosted on. So it gives you, I guess, an overview of you know, what the resources look like. You can actually go down and it actually gives you a bit more information and a summary of what you can expect from this toolkit. And if you go down to the very bottom, you can actually choose the module that you actually want to download. So you've got module one, module two, and module three. So for demonstrative purposes, I'm gonna go into the third module. So here you've actually got um, the introduction video, which will give you an overview of the topics you can expect. But if you go down to the bottom here, you can actually download the module. I'm not gonna do it now because it will take a while for me to, to load it up with all the videos that we've got. So instead, I've already downloaded it. <laughs> Um, so here is module three. So I've got all the three modules here, actually. I've got the recruiting one, onboarding, and the leading one. So I'm going to go into the leading one. And as you can see, you've got all of the topics pretty much laid out for you. Um, and the idea of why we created it like this is that we actually want it to, um, I suppose, do it in such a way that you can dip in and dip out anytime that you want. So it's up to you. Um, you know, the topics that you want or, most, or you're most interested in, you can actually just like dip in and out of it. 
So the introduction one, for example, we've got an instructional video, we've got a volunteering video, and we've got a reflection exercise. So the reflection exercise, for example, if you actually wanted to see it, looks a little bit like, oh, wait, hold on. Technical difficulties. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. So this is, I guess, the reflection exercise in detail. So for example, take a moment to think about the best leader or manager you have ever known, whether it's fictional or in real life. You know, what qualities do they have? Are they very organized, approachable, or authoritative? And you can actually, you know, fill this in. So if I were to think about, you know, for example, uh, Pat is my boss. If I had to think, you know, he's very organized, uh, challenges me. So you can actually just pretty much like fill it out um, as you would a, a normal document, but you can also print it out if you would prefer to do that as well. Um, and then the second question is, what do they do that constitutes them being the best leader? For example, do they give clear instructions and guidance or do they involve you in decision-making processes? Um, and how do they make you feel? So for example, do you feel more competent, more autonomous, or like you are part of the team? So the idea with this exercise is that we wanted people to think about you know, the best leaders that they have, what are some of the qualities do they have, how do they make you feel, and how can you encourage that not only within yourselves, but also within future leaders um, that you are trying to develop within your volunteering group. So that is the reflection exercise. Uh, we're now gonna watch uh, one of the, I'm actually going to make you guys watch one of the videos that we've got, which I've already preloaded. So this is the first, um, I guess the instructional, uh, the first introduction video for the leading volunteers. Uh, module. So we're just going to watch that. Hi, my name is Marilyn Gagné, and I'm from the Future of Work Institute at Curtin University. My expertise is in work motivation, and I've worked with many organizations to help them build good management practices to ensure they have engaged and happy volunteers. My name is Daria Cran, and I'm from the University of Western Australia. My research is focused on leadership, and I've worked with several emergency services organizations in Australia to help them develop better volunteer leadership skills and knowledge. In Australia, the emergency services are facing difficulties engaging and retaining volunteers. So why do people leave volunteering groups? One survey showed that leadership problems and a lack of recognition are two key reasons. So we need to greatly improve our volunteer management. Volunteers are the backbone of the emergency services. Training volunteers to safely provide emergency response is expensive and time consuming. Many geographical areas also have a short supply of people willing and able to volunteer. Thus, it's important that volunteer leaders make every effort to retain the valuable people they already have. To improve volunteer retention, you can adopt a motivational approach to running your volunteering group. To effectively motivate people, it's important to ensure the volunteers in your group are supported in three ways. First, make them feel competent. Ensure your volunteers develop their skills so they feel capable of doing important tasks. When people feel competent, it really energizes them into action. Second, make them feel like they belong. When people feel connected to others in the group, they feel supported and they will support others in turn. Third, make them feel autonomous. As much as possible, your volunteers should feel like they're in control instead of feeling pressured to do things. When people choose their own actions, volunteer work is more meaningful to them and they have a greater sense of ownership. In this module, we'll give you lots of information about how you can enhance your volunteers' feelings of confidence, sense of belonging, and autonomy. What you learn here will help you to increase your volunteers' engagement, satisfaction, and retention, and ultimately increase the effectiveness of your emergency service. Be sure to refer to the reflection exercise available in your introduction folder to help you get started with this module. I have like such good memories. 
<laughs> of having to film all of that um, or helping with the filming. Um, so one of the other videos that I was going to show you uh, is where you actually get to meet the volunteers from North Shore State Emergency Service. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, these volunteers were interviewed uh, to be used as, I guess, case studies where they actually share stories about how they can recruit on board uh, and lead volunteers and, you know, what they do uh, to be successful within their unit. So for this particular module, which is the leading module, we interviewed uh, volunteers from North Shore SES and they were super lovely. And I, I just felt like I couldn't not share at least one of the videos to be able to show you of the kind of content that you can expect uh, if you were to watch these volunteer case studies. Hello, my name is Nick Elliott. I'm the uh, local manager of North Shore State Emergency Service. I've been a member of this unit for uh, just over 15 years. I'm Hazel Darkin. I'm uh, the deputy local manager at North Shore. I've been a volunteer for 13 years and the deputy manager for 11 years. So when I when I joined as a member, um, the the leadership style was very very different to what it is today, but the structure was effectively the same. So the the, the structure hasn't changed a lot in that time at all. Um, however, what we expect of the members and and who we who we invite to now take part in that structure has changed massively. Um, it's a lot more open. It's I'd like to think it's a lot more inviting nowadays. And um, we actually go out to our members and we seek um, um, where they will be able to actually add, actually add, add, add value to that, to our to our unit nowadays, as opposed to actually just being being, being uh, the, the unit being run by four or five people. So there's a lot more people involved now with the daily running of the unit than, than there were certainly 15 years ago when I joined. I think probably the biggest difference in the, the uh, 13 years that I've been a member is that when I joined the unit was much, much smaller. So there were fewer members, which meant that the management team, there was a, a local manager, Nick was the deputy at the time, um, and there weren't really many other defined roles. Uh, it was a little bit ad hoc. If something needed doing, somebody would just do it. Now, with being much larger, we can't operate on that basis. We need more structure. So we've created specific roles and specific areas of responsibility and assigned people to those. And then that means that as a management team, we don't have to worry about absolutely everything. We have other people who can do the day-to-day -day tasks and things just get escalated to us as needed. Yeah, no, and that's very valid point. So we had about, about I think, 12 members, actually active members when I joined, and now we've got just under 60. So we're in a significantly different place to where we were back then. Um, and obviously with that with that increased membership, that opens up a huge opportunity, a huge amount of opportunity in relation to actually being able to cherry pick paper and actually say, hey, you, you're awesome for that in your full-time role, because you may be... Um, bring that in and spend that and, and put that into the volunteer role too. I think one of the downsides though to being a larger unit is that it makes it harder for us to connect with all of the members. Um, so we try very hard as a management team to make sure that we're approachable, that people do feel they can come and talk to us. We're not in an ivory tower and there's, there's a vast gap between a new, brand new member and the management team. It, it does take effort and it does take work, but I think it's really important that they feel they can approach us and talk to us about, about anything. And so we, we go with that approach. Yeah, and we get that, and that happens on a, on a probably I say daily basis. You get emails, you get phone calls. Um, we don't get a lot of people really coming up and, and side side swiping us with with um, with information or, or issues on the Wednesday night. We've generally heard about things prior to then. Um, so you know that communication works very well. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that's the kind of um, I guess the content that you can expect when you watch some of these videos. Uh, so just to kind of dip into like another folder. So for example, we had, um, so that was the introduction folder. If we were to dip into, for example, the recognizing achievements and contributions, we've got uh, an instructional video where we actually go through some of the tips and strategies of how you can recognize achievements and contributions made by your volunteers. We then have a tip sheet where you can actually, um, we actually go through some examples of how you can actually uh, recognize achievements and contributions. And I think Pat actually used uh, this earlier where you can actually go through, you know, for example, some of the ideas that we provide are, you know, informal and verbal recognition, like saying thank you, mentioning achievements and contributions at monthly meetings, ideas like that, but also tangible recognition. So for example, hosting like an awards night, uh, novelty awards, or giving people certificates. Um, so yeah, so we go into a little bit more detail, you know, like, you know, making sure that every contribution that is made by a volunteer 
is, is acknowledged because every single contribution, no matter how big or how small, makes a difference and making sure that they are you know, aware of how they are contributing to the group. So this is an example of a tip sheet. And with the tip sheet, we also have a reflection exercise in this folder as well. So yeah, so you know, reflect on a time that you received recognition for a contribution you made to your volunteering group. How did you receive the recognition for your contribution? So was it mentioned in a meeting or did you receive a reward or a certificate? Um, and how did it make you feel? Did you feel like you were put on the spot or did you feel like you belonged in the team or did you feel like you made a difference? Um, so yeah, just to kind of reflect on what are some of the practices that uh, you do within your group to be able to kind of recognize achievements and contributions uh, and what are some of the ways that you can actually recognize the achievements and contributions made by other volunteers within your group. So yeah, just to give you an idea of, yeah, that's the kind of content that you can expect uh, from the modules. So we've got, you know, another, uh, you know, for example, a, a video here of, you know, a case study of, you know, North Shore SES actually sharing ways that they actually recognize achievements and contributions within their, within their group. So everything's pretty much laid out so that if you were to actually download the module, you have everything already in its dedicated folders. So uh, the idea, as I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, we just want it to be able to make it so that somebody who is interested in a particular topic, you don't have to go into introduction and then be forced to do everything and then go into influencing volunteers. And you don't have to do it in a sequential order. If, they, if there is a particular topic that you are interested in, you can just dip in and out. Um, and that's the way that we've designed the module. Um, and in every single module as well, we've also got, um, I guess I called it like the mega document where we actually have all of the resources. So things like, you know, tip sheets, uh, thinking exercises, uh, reflection exercises, and editable templates. Uh, you've got them all in the individual folders that are relevant to the, to the topic folder that they are in. But if you decided that you actually just wanted to um, you know, for example, just print everything in one go. We've got this mega document that is in each of the folders, and basically it has, you know, all of the all of the content inside. So you've got pretty much, um, as you can see here, topic folder one. You've got the reflection exercise, topic folder two. You've got uh, the tip sheet. So pretty much all of the the documents that you would have needed to print if you were to go into each individual folder you've got it in this one mega document so that you can actually just print out just one document as opposed to having to go into every single folder and having to print it out. So if you decided that you wanted to do the entire module, you can do that and you can just print this mega document. Uh, but if you want it to do just you know, one or two topics, you can just go into those folders uh, and just print out you know, the relevant documents and watch the videos um, there. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. I think I just have, two more slides to share. So I'm realizing that I'm just going back and forth, but I promise I'm almost done. So I've got the QR code and the link here if anybody wanted to take a screenshot of the screen right here, but I will also be sharing uh, this QR code and also this link at the very end as well. Um, so just as I mentioned earlier, we do have the uh, I guess mega documents so that you can actually just print everything in one go if that's what you decide that you want to do. Uh, but otherwise, all of the uh, resources that are relevant to each topic is within their own folder. So you can also choose that option if you would prefer to just dip in and out depending on the topics that you're most interested in. Uh, the templates are in a PDF format, but if you choose, you can also uh, copy and paste uh, the content into Microsoft Word and actually make it your own if you decided to to go down that route. Um, so how can you actually use uh, the toolkit? So uh, the way that you can actually use the toolkit is if, for example, if you are an emergency service volunteer, you can just download the modules from the website. Uh, just bear in mind that the zip files are a little bit large. So maybe just make sure that you have enough space um, in your computer to be able to, to accommodate that. 
Uh, and once you download the modules, uh, as you've already seen, you've got all the topics pretty much laid out for you with all of the videos and the resources in its dedicated folder. So pretty much you just download the module and you can just enjoy learning from the get-go. Uh, if you are a emergency staff member within an emergency service organization who is responsible for training, uh, I will be sharing the slides uh, with the audience afterwards if, if they're you know, interested, because I do have a full structure of each module in this slide deck. It's actually in my extra slides at the very end, if anybody's interested in seeing it, where I pretty much have, you know, what topic folder, um, what's the topic folder name, and then what's the content in each of the in each of the folders. So if anybody's interested in that, I'm happy to share the slides um, in a little bit. Uh, and if uh, and when you actually download the modules, you have all of the videos there. So you can pretty much just upload the videos and resources into your training platforms, whether it's you know Blackboard or, or LMS. But we also have uh, all of the videos uploaded into YouTube as well. So we can actually pass you uh, the, we've got like an Excel document that has all the URL links to the YouTube videos. So you can pretty much embed that into your training platform if you would prefer to, to choose that option instead. If you are a district or an area officer, uh, you can pretty much share information about our toolkit uh, and encourage volunteers to look at the slides and maybe visit the toolkit website where you know there's a little bit more information. And if you happen to be a volunteer who's not from the emergency services, uh, as Pat mentioned before, uh, the psychological theories and strategies that we, we go through in, in these resources are applicable across the board. So while the case studies and the examples that we give are specific to emergency services, uh, the strategies that we, we discuss and how you can you know, give support and how you can recruit people, uh, that's, that's applicable across the board, across different organizations, um, whether or not you're volunteering or not. So yeah, we've tried to make it in a way so that you know, the, the theories that we, that we discuss and the strategies that we give um, are based on what we've discussed with people as, as what works, but also what is correct based on evidence-based literature. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it for me. Um, I just wanna like highlight that if you do end up using the, um, the, the toolkit and, and you wanna give us feedback, it, it honestly makes my day when I actually happen to get feedback from a volunteer or from uh, somebody from a volunteer organization telling me that they, they, they're using our resources and they're trying to incorporate it into their training, it like, yeah, it makes my day when I get emails like that. Um, but yes, I've, I've just left um, our contact information on there if you wanted to uh, give us feedback or if you have any questions. Um, again, I do want to stress that I will be sharing uh, this slide at the very end of our webinar so that, you know, if you haven't had time to take a screenshot of the QR code and the link, you will have a chance to do that um, in a little bit. So now I'm going to be passing, um, I was going to say pass the baton, but I'm going to say pass the mic to uh, Kate, who's going to be sharing with us uh, yeah, her experiences of actually using these resources and how they're incorporating it into, into DFES. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Hawa. My name's Kate White, and I am the Senior Coordinator for Volunteer Capability and Sustainability at DFES. And I just want to say thanks so much to Blythe and Pat and Hawa for asking me to speak with you today and share our experience. At DFES, as Pat mentioned, we have been so fortunate to be involved with this research really from the beginning. And we were able to, um, you know, contribute in meaningfully in its development, but also benefit in a really meaningful way from that very early development. And I think I just want to say to people who are listening to some of this for the first time, there is a lot in this um, product. It's a lot of information and there's a lot that volunteers and people who work with and manage volunteers can learn. And that could feel a little bit overwhelming. But one of the incredibly clever things about it is its um, structure, the way that it's been broken up into many separate areas of information and that allows us as end users to be able to identify focus areas for volunteer groups as well as focus areas for people who work with volunteer teams and it doesn't have to be um, approached in a even in a in a sort of a, a 
from the beginning to the end. You can just move in into any areas as you go along. So that's kind of jumping forward a little bit, but I wanted to tell a little story. Um, I want to track back and just tell a little bit of a story. So the challenge for DFES is that we have five separate services and you've seen um, a couple of photos of our marine rescue, but you've also seen people from the SES as well talking today. So we have fire services, bushfire services, SES and marine rescue. And of course, people who have worked with emergency services volunteers and volunteers generally will understand exactly what that means, that those groups feel a really strong sense of identity. So creating products for those groups to use in their recruitment when their recruitment issues feel really unique to them um, is really challenging. And the success of this product has been that it provides a foundation that's really based in with an authoritative voice. So it's been a super clever synthesis of the academic approach applied by Pat and Hawa and the team and the lived experiences of those individual volunteer teams. And that authority has really helped us as we have rolled the product out um, to our groups across Western Australia. And I was thinking about it and thinking, it's a framework that's kind of applicable everywhere, but it's specific enough to apply locally and general enough to apply throughout the state. So it has this capacity for us to be able to say, use this, let's, let's focus on this idea here with your group, how does that apply? And, and in each and every occasion when I do that, I'm able to draw out from a group who may be, you know, located in Derby or somewhere where they think they've got the most unique recruitment or onboarding issues, yet they'll be able to find some element of it that they can apply to their um, circumstance. So I want to let you know about how we use it. So, and, and also to give you a little bit of a, I guess we are, we have an advantage because we've been involved as the products have evolved over time. And actually the biggest challenge, which Hawa and Pat and the team helped us understand for DFES is, re, uh, is um, retention. It's one of our biggest challenges. So actually the first toolkit or the first booklet that we got in its first iteration was the onboarding um, booklet. So we've been fortunate that we've been able to develop our understanding of these concepts and how our teams um, adapt to them over time. And this latest um, iteration, which you now all have access to, is just the most superb refinement of that uh, development over time. So how we use it is that we make these products the basis of all our teaching around these concepts of recruitment, onboarding and leading. So if I'm dealing with a group, a small group of volunteers, I'm going to be using these messages and these products. If I'm dealing with a group of staff from DFES who are learning more about working with and managing volunteers, we're using these products. So we absolutely work all the time to just get a consistent message. If someone wants to say, say what, you know, they ring me up from a regional office and say, oh, I've got a particular group who are having this particular problem. I, it's easy for me to kind of go off on a tangent and wax lyrical about all different things, but actually I force myself and, and develop a sort of a, um, discipline to grab the books and refer exactly so that we absolutely get a very consistent uh, message and that it, it keeps it quite simple and then as volunteers themselves are exposed to it they're getting that message reiterated over time which is really important um, and often the end user so the way that the products are designed and I think you'll appreciate working with volunteer groups, the, the level of skill within groups is very diverse, very vast. Sometimes you have managers, you know, you've met Hazel and Nick there from the SES in North Shore. They're both professional people, they're highly skilled. They understand a lot about structure and creating environments that are appealing to people. And that's excellent. And that's 
also great for them because there's other groups that maybe they don't have those resources at the ready and what is good about these products is that it actually is always applicable to all of those different groups and so even if it's a staff member a, a more well educated volunteer leader or someone who has more skills at their disposal or someone who maybe doesn't have those level of skills at their disposal actually these groups can be pitched at all of those different groups and the resources and I would say that the introduction of the new reflection um, tools the videos which are excellent really nice and short and easy for people to understand even again give us even more capacity to pitch the resources across the different end user groups and I know you can appreciate an organisation that is as big as DFES, we're across the state, like I said, we've got different services, but we've also got different management teams who, who all have their own unique operating conditions and all of the resources are suitable for them all of the time. So when I'm um, out and about, I do a range of different things. So we have provided a toolbox on our volunteer hub and the volunteer hub provides volunteers access to these. And I'm in the process, Pat knows, of embedding the YouTube videos against the toolkits and the, and the booklets. I haven't yet put in the reflection tools, but I'm running a workshop for 50 plus people and I'm going to use those reflection tools in my workshop. So I'm kind of cherry picking the resources at the moment, but that's because we have a, an established use of some of the resources in our own version of some of the booklets. But remembering again, like I said at the beginning, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a consecutive learning process and people really will dip in and out. And we're all aware that when we catch a volunteer's time, it might only be a short period of time that they have to learn something new and that it might only be one element of those many different elements that we looked at. So we do large group workshops in person. We do small online workshops. We do small online workshops in person. We might sit down with people and just break up a single element. That might be something like recruitment channels or volunteer role descriptions, where you really hone in on just one single element of a larger um, idea or larger sort of uh, resource. Um, we have run recruitment campaigns over the last couple of years that have, we've called Hyper Local. So we did that in collaboration with our marketing team and they were digital recruitment campaigns. But as part of that process, we ran workshops with those teams. So those local teams that were identified were obliged to participate in the workshops because we didn't want them undertaking recruitment without some education beforehand, including the staff who worked with them. And so in the first iteration of those workshops, we ran recruitment work, we ran recruitment focused workshops. And in this last 12 months, which was 12 months following, we've run onboarding workshops with those groups who'd already undertaken a recruitment workshop. So we're trying to build on their education around these um, aspects. So, um, and then I guess the main thing that I'm thinking about at the moment, which is kind of exciting, is that we are thinking about getting the, um, the whole lot of these modules uploaded into our learning management system so that volunteers can access them um, at, again, in, in a, through a different format for us. So um, that's what the story I have to tell. I mean, the big challenge is what we see is that there's support volunteer teams make, uh, the support volunteer teams need to make their teams great. And there's support volunteer teams need to deal with like the larger social and societal or societal and um, environmental challenges that their communities experience. And the elements of these resources help them to do both of those things. And that's the most important um, from our perspective. And that's what helps why, we, why we've, you know, so happy that we've got access to these resources and been so, and benefited so much by being involved in the development of them over time. Well, that's our story. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and thank you to attendees who have stuck with us. We've run a little bit over time, but I think it's been really worthwhile taking that time. Um, I think Pat, Hala and the rest of the team are to be strongly commended for the product that you've put together. Just to echo Kate's point, I think it's a really clever mixing of research-based knowledge and volunteer experience and knowledge and lived experience of volunteering in emergency services presented in a way that is really adaptable for people to use it for their own context and in their own way. So to take control of how they use the resources and what they do with them. And I think that's a, a really um, strong element of what you've put together here. So um, congratulations to you and to the rest of the team for doing that. And thank you to those who sent through some positive feedback through the Q&A on the resources. It is wonderful for researchers to hear that. We don't have many avenues and conduits for researchers to get feedback like that on the work that they've done. So they really do appreciate it. And if you can send feedback on via email direct to Pat and Hawa at any time, I'm sure they're really pleased. They'd be really pleased to hear that at any time. Also, thanks to Pat Hawa and Kate for making my job so easy. Um, any questions that I had jotted down during the session you answered really well at some point. So I think you've given us all exactly the right information that we needed to know about the resources in order to put them to use. So um, I really appreciate that. So I will not keep you any longer. Um, that, so that brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you all for your time and um, your attention today. Uh, and just to reiterate the webinar recording and the slides that we use today will be made available um, on the NHRA website after the webinar, so you have access to them. And also to reiterate, it is wonderful that Pat Hara and the team have made these resources so freely available and so accessible. They're available for anyone to use in whatever way, shape or form they would like to. I think that's a really generous offering from the research team, considering I know the time and energy and, and passion they've put into developing. So I appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. That brings us to the end of the webinar now. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Goodbye.